Right, okay, hello. Well, let's uh, start part two of this um, class on, um, you know, the Christianities. I mean, we're going to just do an introduction this week, and then next week we'll do, we'll, you know, carry on, because there's more here than we can do in just one week, <laughs> as you're probably realising. Um, okay, so we've got the Gospels in front of us, and... If anyone's interested in all the details, you know, listen to my detailed line-by-line -line commentary on each of the Gospels, all of which are amazing. Uh, Mark is thought to be one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest, some say. I think it's Matthew. Mark is like Matthew slimmed down. Lots of the stories are taken out. It's much brusker, swifter. Mark was thought to be a younger man in the, in the Jesus Sanger called John Mark, who, <clears throat> whose mother was a, a patron of Jesus, possibly where the Last Supper was held, was her place. Um, and he later writes it down when he goes to Rome as a, as a disciple of Peter, who inherited the crown or the mantle from Jesus' authority when he died <coughs> and was resurrected according to the Gospels. So Mark then writes down stories that Peter would have told him. He, he would have been the source for a lot of this stuff. And that's one of the interesting things about biblical studies, is trying to trace the oral roots of the Gospels, because obviously it was an oral teaching. I mean, a lot of the Gospels is Jesus' teaching, orally. He didn't get his disciples to write down stuff. They had to remember it. And interestingly, the word for a disciple in Greek is a mathematici, which is from the Greek word the same as mathematics. And at one point, in one of the most famous passages in the Gospels, Jesus is with his mathematici, like his math students. <laughs> and if you think back to the Kabbalah, you know, which is quite mathematical, I think Jesus was also teaching a sort of cosmic mathematics about good and evil, how you balance them, how you work out if an action is good or evil, or... You know, like, if, if you've been married twice, should can you get married again? And can you marry your brother's widow? And, you know, all these were mathematical questions, which Jesus, because of his Kabbalistic learning, was able to, to work out with his mathematics, his students. Um, but, of course, you see, society didn't like all that, because society doesn't like wisdom. It's sophiophobic. Then you have the Gospel of Luke, which is brilliant, I love Luke, he was thought to be an artist and a doctor, he was a medical doctor, um, who was from Antioch, which was up the coast in what's now Syria, and a learned man, he could write in perfect fluent Greek, so he was, you know, Greek speaking from Antioch, which was a Greek speaking um, community, um, possibly um, a pagan, might have been a follower of Plato and stuff, or he might have been Jewish, but a Hellenistic type of, um, you know, a Greek-speaking Jew, of which there were many, um, particularly in Alexandria, in Egypt. And by tradition, Christ had some interesting relationships with Egypt. We've seen that he was taken there as a baby. Um, there's also source, source material that points to the fact that he probably went back there as a young man to complete his later studies. And there's a very important book here called The Foreigner, A Search for the First Century Jesus by Desmond Stewart. This is um, on a sarcophagus. At that time in Egypt, they were very good at art and they used to paint beautiful portraits of the dead person. This is a young man who's been buried. And I've seen these mummies which have these beautiful paint paintings on. Um, they're in the museum in Cairo, but also the British Museum and the Louvre and things. It's very probable, I would say 100% certain, that Jesus, as a younger man, went back to Alexandria to study. Why? Because his father, Joseph, um, had relatives living in Egypt from a high intellectual class, if you want. I mean, where does, where does Joseph take baby Jesus to flee Herod? To Egypt, because he has relatives there who look after them. Um, it was the intellectual center of advanced Jewish studies in the day. And in Alexandria, they translated the entire Bible into Greek. 
And there was a Greek-speaking, bilingual Jewish community in Alexandria of many, many thousands who were also reading Plato and Greek philosophy and were learned in both Greek knowledge and Jewish knowledge. And they were trying to work on a synthesis. They were looking at the Bible and saying, this Moses, like the world begins in seven days. I mean, we've got to interpret that allegorically, don't we? I mean, that can't mean literally seven days. I mean, that wouldn't be long enough. Because we know, like, Africa's quite big. The Nile's quite big. I mean, how, how could God have created all this world in seven days? So we're dealing with an allegory, aren't we? And that's, that was, oh yeah, well that's what Plato says. His myth of Atlantis, that's an allegory as well. It's not literal, it's a story about moral degradation and how human beings have to be perpetually topped up with wisdom. Or they, like, default to bad, you know. So, the intellectual elites of Jewish thought in Alexandria, which is where I believe Jesus studied, were teaching <clears throat> that you had to interpret the Bible in a figurative, allegorical and mystical way, which was what the Kabbalah had been saying. So this is where Jesus got his higher education. It's where he got his degree, if you want. And so when the rabbis were saying, where do you get your degrees from? He should have said, Alexandria. But I don't know why he didn't. I don't know. You know, there's mysteries about that. Um... But they just didn't like him from the go-get, so, so that's probably why he kept quiet. Um, so this book is, yeah, um, presenting lots of evidence in that direction. Luke tells, he's a great storyteller. You know, if you want to read just one gospel, read Luke. Um, and lots of the famous stories and teachings and so on are all in Luke. And then you come to John, who again, was a close disciple, it's believed, of Jesus, from Galilee, a fisherman, um, who followed Jesus, you know, right through his life, and, and really got the message, maybe in a depth that some of the other disciples didn't get. So instead of telling a story, John tells the meaning of events. He tells the metaphysics behind the story. Um, for him, Jesus was... Um, the Son of God. Now, that phrase is complex. What does it mean? I've written a study of the concept of the Son of God right, in, in intellectual history. In those days, in those times, in the Mediterranean, a Son of God was someone that did amazing work for humanity. was like a supercharged hero. Um, and <clears throat> it, was, it was popular in Greek thought, in, in the Homeric legends, you know, sons of God were quite common. Um, and they were always expected to do heroic things, like Theseus or Hercules or, you know. To be a son of God meant you had a big job ahead of you. But you would pull it off because you had God on your side, or the gods, right? Um, it was also true in, in uh, Indian thought, in um, Hindu and Buddhist world, to be a son of God was, uh, you know, like a job description, and it meant more was expected of you. Like, it didn't mean you got an easy ride and could chill out on your sofa all day. No, it meant you had to get up and do lots of stuff. Um, and in one of the most important Buddhist sutras, the Lotus Sutra, which, um, you know, is a stupendous piece of work, and which was written about this time when Jesus was appearing on the planet, right? It says that when Buddha was teaching these advanced sermons for his most devout students as he was teaching you had all the gods came to listen Buddha's disciples but you also had sons of God would come like sons of Indra, sons of Brahma sons of Vishnu and they're all there in the audience but out of body invisible, only visible to the clairvoyant eye of the sage and that's how the Lotus Sutra begins like the most important of all Buddhist scriptures says the sons of God were all listening to Buddha's sermons. So that concept, now what's interesting, I've shown you during the break, this wonderful book, The Original Jesus, again it's a piece of detective work by E.R. Gruber and H. Kirsten, published by Element Books, has, looks at the very interesting synchronicities between the gospel stories and the early Buddhist sutras. Because 
Buddha, in a sense, was a prototypical Jesus figure. A heroic young man goes out, finds enlightenment, <clears throat> and then spends his life teaching it and giving it away as a, like, um, a present to people. But only if they accept the discipline and become proper students. Well, fast forward 500 years, and that's essentially what Jesus is doing. So their theory is that Jesus must have gone along the road that left from Galilee all the way to Takshila, which was a monastery in northern India, or Pakistan, where they were developing the Mahayana Buddhist ideas of we should work tirelessly for liberating all beings from suffering through compassion. And it was precisely there and then they were writing things like the Lotus Sutra and inventing Mahayana Buddhism, which meant you don't work just for your own enlightenment, like, I'm all right, I'm enlightened, that's fine, shut the door. No, you work for everybody's enlightenment, the poor, the crippled, the black, the white, the yellow, all the races, all the genders, men and women. Um, we're all entitled to our birthright, which is, which is absolute enlightenment and love and compassion and wisdom. Now, that's what the Buddhists were saying in theory. They were also saying that we all get to reincarnate again and again and again until we get there. And that once you've got to a certain level of that, you can then choose where to incarnate strategically. You can incarnate into this family and this country because that can help push the collective enlightenment of humanity on further. Um, and, you know, you might choose to be born in a really poor area um, in order to, like, raise up the people. Um, <clears throat> Well, that's what this book is claiming, that that was, that was Jesus was on mission from the Bodhisattva school of thought. He was like sent on mission to raise the enlightenment quotient of that region. It's an, it's an interesting theory, because that, that region, which was having this conflict between superpowers, Judea and Rome and Greece, and everyone was killing everyone else, like they needed an enlightened teacher. So this theory is that Jesus was sent consciously from even before his birth. He was conceived to go in there as a, let's translate Messiah as world bodhisattva figure, like a great teacher, right? a mahasattva. Well, you know, I'd love to be able to turn the clocks back of the cameras of the collective karma of the Akashic Records and see whether Jesus ever did make that trip to Takshila. I'd love to watch the movie. It's possible. You know, he might have spent a few years in Alexandria and then he said, okay, now I'm off, now I'm off east. I hear this, I've met some monks, they seem quite cool. He was obviously very precocious and um, he would have therefore wanted to find knowledge wherever it was possible and that meant traveling. Well, fine, you know, let's, let's go. Um, and there are many, <coughs> um, this is a picture of the mountain, Vulture Peak, where Buddha used to talk with his disciples. And in a sense, you can see that Christ, this theory is that was partly consciously modeling himself on what Buddha had done, <coughs> and just introducing it to a new culture. But he wasn't calling it Buddhism, because that would have annoyed the locals. He was calling it just teachings, you know, just teachings. And... Um, in fact, there was, there was no real consensus on what to call it for, for, a, for, a, for, a, for quite, a, quite a while. It certainly wasn't called Christianity. Um, he, he never said, I'm, I'm going to teach Christianity. No, no, that, you know, that, that wasn't the word. It was the way or the, the means to, to find truth. Um, he might have called it advanced mathematics of God or something. <laughs> um, Okay, anyway, John was definitely, uh, he's worth reading if you've never read any of these things. Um, here's a saying typical of John. When Jesus spoke to the people again, he said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not be walking in the dark. He will have the light of life. What does that mean? You know, like, what? Light of life? You know, well... Read it in the Greek and it, it sort of dances off the page more easily. But it's obviously a metaphysical thing. I mean, Jesus isn't literally saying, I've got the lamp, follow me in the dark. He's talking about a sort of inner light. 
he's got an inner light, which is called gnosis in Greek, inner knowledge. Um, and he's, and this is, this is the nub of what Christ was teaching, was how to reach that inner light. Well, that's the same as enlightenment. That's the Buddhist idea. Um, now, whether Jesus himself ever actually went to Takshila and studied, he might have just met wandering pilgrims and sages. He could have met them in Alexandria, where there were definitely Buddhist teachers around at that time. And they had the biggest library in the world at the time, in the Museum of Alexandria. Um, <clears throat> and he could have just figured it out by himself without having to, you know, travel there in person. Because to sages, telepathy and stuff are realities. It's like a cosmic internet. You can tune in at a distance to the wisdom of China or Tibet without physically having to go there, you see. And, and that's possible. Um, anyway, so John is brilliant. Now, to complicate things, studying the, the Gospels of the official four has to now be supplemented by two others which have only been discovered in recent decades the first is the gospel of thomas which is here uh, my namesake from found in nag hammadi in egypt in just after world war ii in about 1948 i think uh, or 1945 even some bedouin boys were chasing a goat and it had got stuck in a cave and they had to follow it in. And in there they found these, these big clay jars. And they'd never been in this cave, so halfway up a mountain on the edge of the Nile Valley. And inside the cave jars were parchments, like written manuscripts. And they were just young boys, they, but they thought these might be valuable, so they took them home, showed the family... And eventually they found their way onto the market. It's a miracle they survived. Um, not all of them did. Some of them were burned by one of the old grannies in the family that thought they were good for fuel. She'd like, burn them to make coffee or whatever. We lost priceless manuscripts. <laughs> um, but we do have the Gospel of Thomas. And in my commentary I've done on the Gospel of Thomas, I've gone into much more detail because... What's so interesting about Thomas is it's a Gnostic gospel. It's much more about how to find enlightenment than about what Jesus did on last Thursday. It's less stories and much more metaphysics. So it's even more than John. Right? Um, it starts as follows. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Thomas wrote down. And he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished and he will rule over the all. Like, those are the first sayings. They're called logion, or sayings. Um, the first one, which I explain in detail in my commentary, I don't think what Jesus is saying is he's not going to die. Some of them interpret that. But he won't experience the pain, the pangs, the anxiety, the neurotic, oh, help, I'm dying thing. Because he'll already have died before he dies. He'll know about the next life. He'll have visited it in his out-of-body journeys or whatever. He'll have been taught the keys to the kingdom of God. So, so death will just be like coming home to like his other home, right? Beaming up to a, a, another world where the souls live. And that's what the Kabbalah taught. So what Jesus was saying is, look, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be able to teach you how to cope with death when it comes. That's what I think that means. The second thing that's interesting let him who seeks continue seeking there we are until he finds and when he finds he will be troubled so I read this as a kind of like we start off at the bottom of the tree um, working out our troubled relationship with matter as babies we have to learn to eat and defecate and 
cope with having a body and all this stuff. It takes years. Then, then we gradually learn to master it, and we're like toddlers climbing up the tree of life. Okay. Um, and that's the seeking. <clears throat> but then, when you find, you realise, God, you know, how exciting, and you fall in love, you explore that aspect of sensuality and materiality. But it's all a bit troubling, because, like, well, what's it really mean? Like, she left me and went off with another bloke, or whatever, you know, the heart pains of, of youth and adolescence. And gradually, then you go to university and study, and you learn intellectual discipline, and maybe you read the Bible for the first time, and you learn, oh, there's a meaning to all this. There's a story going on. So you climb up the tree of it. And, <clears throat> and then you become astonished. You know, because, because life is pretty extraordinary. And if you look at the patterns of everything from the smallest leaf to your fingers, to the stars, to karmic events, to synchronicities, you see there's a pattern behind it all. And that's what the Kabbalah teaches. That's what I think Jesus was teaching. And then at that moment, when you're astonished, you will be able to rule over the all. Now that's the point at which you come to Keta, which is the, like, the crown, the ruler. You find that in yourself, that, that majesty of, of knowing to, how to do the right thing in the right context. Like somebody comes up and shouts at you or insults you. Well, you don't. You know, you, you know what to do because you're in the place of the rulership of the all. Um, it must have happened to Jesus countless times. He was constantly being insulted, heckled. Stones are thrown at him. And it's amazing he carried on, to be honest. I don't know how he got the confidence and the courage. Um, but he was coming from that place of Keta. Um, <clears throat> another very important saying in Thomas, um, the Gospel, which is really worth reading, um, relates to this question of what is a Messiah. Because the word Christ means Messiah. Well, what does that mean? You know, I don't know what a Messiah is. Have you, do you know? It meant somebody that was anointed as, as the king. That's the exoteric meaning, the king of Israel. But more than that, like the king of Dharma, the king of truth, the Messiah was the teacher who would bring world salvation. Now, what that meant in literal terms is someone who'd reached Keta level of awareness in the Kabbalistic terms, or enlightenment. Only someone who's truly enlightened can teach from that place of Keta. Now, if you're willing to go before the authorities and present them with, hang on, I've turned up now, I'm coming from Keta, and what you're doing is wrong, that beheading John the Baptist you did, that was wrong, that sleeping with your brother's wife and all that promiscuity you're doing and, you know, killing people you don't agree with, that's all wrong. That's, that's coming from Keto, you see. And um, obviously that's what Jesus was doing. But did that make him the Messiah? <clears throat> well, that was the big question. There was no agreement on that. The Jews themselves in the temple establishment in, in Jerusalem said, no, he's a false Messiah. He's just some crazy teacher from Galilee who's just got beyond himself. He's a threat to our power, a threat to our deal with the Romans, so we're going to have him killed off. Um, but other people weren't sure, and some of his, even his disciples, they're always asking him in the Gospels, who are you? Are you the Messiah? What, what, what does that mean? You know, what are you going to do? Anyway, there's a wonderful passage in the Gospel of Thomas, which is about this. I'm going to read it out. And you find an equivalent passage in the other Gospels. So we know it's something that they would have talked about. Um, I'll find the actual text. Mm, yes. Um, ah, right, here it is. Okay. Mm. The disciples said to Jesus, and we know from the... Um, the other Gospels, this, this exchange conversation takes place in a place in northern Israel called now um, Caesarea Philippi, which back in those days was called Panias. And I've been there. There's a cave sacred to the god Pan, 
who was the god of nature. And out of that rushes a river which becomes the River Jordan. So we're talking the north of Israel. Near Mount Hermon, the water comes off the mountain through that cave, sacred to Pan, who's the god of everything, Pan, um, and then comes down and becomes the Jordan, which is the water that everyone was baptizing with, especially John the Baptist. So very sacred, holy place. And it says in the Gospels, that's the place Jesus liked to go more than anywhere else with his innermost disciples. He would go there in private, a lot far away from Jerusalem, even far away from Galilee, further up into the hills, and have these private discussions with them. So we can try and reconstruct what they were talking about. Jesus said to his disciples, Compare me to someone and tell me whom I am like. Simon Peter said to him, You're like a righteous angel. Matthew said to him, You're like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Jesus said, I'm not your rabbi because you have drunk. You have become intoxicated from the bubbling stream which I have measured out. And he took him and withdrew and told him three things. When Thomas returned to the companions, they asked him, What did Jesus say? What did he say to you? Thomas said, If I tell you even one of these things, which he told me, you will pick up stones and throw them at me. A fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Now that's a really interesting passage. Like, what on earth are these three things that, that Jesus told Thomas in secret? Well, it was like advanced teachings on how to get to enlightenment rapidly. That's my surmise, and that's what I've said in my commentary. And I think if you study the, the whole of the Gospel of Thomas in depth and the context, that's what it was about. In other words, Jesus wasn't just getting up and saying people, people be good, love each other, and then sitting down to some applause and eating fish. No, there was actually some substance to the teachings. And just as Buddha, when he was teaching, he wasn't just saying, karma, codependent origination, enlightenment, and then sitting down. He was actually teaching how to meditate, how to use your visual powers, how to walk the Eightfold Path, and so on. There was a substance of the teaching. What was the substance of the Christian teaching? Like, this is not taught in most churches. They, they, they've they got stuck at this, it's like a record stuck on a needle. That you've just got to have faith in Jesus. That's all, and sing hymns. But, with all due respect, you know, we've been having faith in Jesus for 2,000 years, and they're killing each other in Ukraine and Russia, because... They're obviously having faith in different Jesuses, you know, like, what's going on here? So I'm saying, let's get back to the original teachings, let's try and rediscover what was the content of Jesus' actual teachings. Not, you know, I don't want to have faith in, in that, I want to have knowledge in what those teachings were, so I can then apply them in my life, in your life, in, in Ukraine and in the problems we're facing on the planet, global warming, you know. If these, if these teachings were valid, if Jesus was the actual Messiah, then these teachings must be dynamite. They must be the secret to peace. And I believe they are, but I believe that we have to go back and reinterpret them from the source. And that's why I've spent years studying, you know, all the Gospels and the Gnostic Gospels. Okay, the other one of the Gnostic Gospels that's really exciting is the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Because what is said here in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is that, well, what's said in several of the Gospels is that Mary Magdalene was the, the, the top female in the Sangha. Most of the twelve disciples were male, but Mary was possibly his girlfriend, certainly his top female students. Um, it's said that, you know, they might have been like man and wife. We don't know. And that's why when I came to France, because there's a tradition that Mary Magdalene 
escaped after the crucifixion here to France and came to live in the south. And that was known about, and the Cathars believed that, and others in the south of France. And I think it's very possibly true, which is amazing. So that's why I set up the Mary Magdalene Studies Association here in France. So we can research this and find if it's true. I mean, I took the students to Veselay, where they show you part of the arm of Mary Magdalene. There's, there's a basilica in the south, near Marseille, where they show you the skull of Mary Magdalene. I don't know if these are genuine or true. I mean, they've been carbon dated. It's possible. I suspect that Mary Magdalene did end up here in France. And that's why her gospel is so interesting. And unfortunately, it came in fragments. It was found in Egypt, um, not in the Nag Hammadi find, but at a place called Achmin, uh, which was also called Panopolis, sacred to Pan, the god, again, um, in, in the middle of Egypt, along the Nile Valley, uh, where there were a lot of very interesting Gnostics and alchemists and esotericists, and they found this Gospel of Mary in a wall over a Christian burial ground hidden away in about the 1890s. It was discovered by a German archaeologist and ended up in Berlin, which is where the original is. Um, and it talks about the spiritual journey, both after death, but also in meditation and spiritual practice. Um, Peter said to Mary, sister, we know that the Saviour loved you more than the rest of women. Tell us the words of the Saviour which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. So this conversation is happening after the crucifixion. Jesus has gone. The disciples are all milling around, not knowing what to do. They're all upset. A lot of them are crying. And Peter's saying to Mary, look, you were his closest friend, girlfriend. Like, tell us, did he say anything to you in secret about any of this stuff? You know, that he's hungry for wisdom. Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you, I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak to them these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision. And I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. He answered and said, Blessed are you that you did not waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there the treasure is. I said to him, Lord, now does he who sees the vision see it through the soul or through the spirit? The Saviour answered and said, He does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, but the mind which is between the two. That is what sees the vision. That's a little fragment from this gospel. I mean, that's really interesting. That's like Mary Magdalene is having a discussion with Christ in, in spirit, but using her intellect, you know, Christianity is often thought to be anti-intellect, anti-scholarship and all that. I, I don't agree with that at all, I think. Jesus insisted on the highest intellectual standards by his disciples, including Mary Magdalene, you know. Um, and that's why we've set up the Mary Magdalene Studies Association. We're having some very interesting meetings every 22nd of July, which is her feast day. Um, and anyway, the gospel goes on, um, <coughs> and it... Um, it ends when she describes a sequence of visions when she's able to transcend evil and suffering and pain and fear. And Christ gives her the strength to do that. Um.